Hi everyone. So I'm going to record my lecture from the classroom this time. So a little bit different, a uh, little bit different angle too with this tablet, but I will go ahead and share my screen. So we are going to be working on chapter 13, Diagnostic Imaging. So we're starting on page 380. So hopefully now you can follow along with me. Let me prop this up a little bit more. Hopefully now you can really follow along with me as I talk about diagnostic imaging. So this is kind of telling you that with diagnostic procedures, you need to pay attention to what's happening in the surgery. So, you know, many surgeries, you're gonna take out specimen, right? A lot of times it's just gonna be diagnostic. So they will consider it a surgery, even though we're not excising anything, we're not repairing anything, we're just diagnosing. So we're going in to take a look maybe with a laparoscope. You'll do diagnostic laparoscopies very often. So this means something's going on in the abdomen. We don't know what it is. We're going to go in and diagnose. Now, after they do that diagnostic laparoscopy, they might find something and they might want to do more with the surgery. So it could be a diagnostic laparoscopy. So that's a laparoscopic case with the belly and they go in and look and then they find, let's say an obstruction in the bowel, and then it's going to morph into a bowel obstruction case. So just an idea of what you're learning in this chapter. Some cases are truly just diagnostic. Others, you're gonna come in diagnostic and then it's gonna morph into actually excising something or repairing something. But even more into depth than that, this chapter is going into diagnostic imaging and tests that are done before surgery. So as we go through this, I'll be sure to point out to you, is this something we're gonna do in the operating room or something before the patient gets to the operating room? So I'll point out the differences for you as we go along. Let's start on page 380 or 381 rather. So it starts with sources of patient data. So you definitely need to read all the way through these pages, but I'm going to stop at a couple of little things. So first paragraph, last sentence, this chapter is going to explore the wide variety of tools and tests available to determine the most appropriate course of surgical care. So again, sometimes this is just diagnostic to decide what type of surgery we are going to do. So you should definitely be aware of all of these bullet points underneath. You should be familiar with the term H&P as history and physical. You will hear uh, different people in the operating room say that term. Was the H&P done before the case? The answer should be yes. And you should know that that's their history and physical. Of course, there'll be lab and pathology tests. Look at where it says endoscopic procedures. Endoscopic procedures. So next to that, I want you to put diagnostic. Now, there's some examples of this. Now, endoscopic could be so many different things, but in general, if you're talking about working in the endo room in surgery, this isn't cutting into things type of surgery. This is putting a big scope down a tube. So we're going to either do an EGD, EGD, excuse me, and go down the mouth with a scope to check everything out to see if there's anything to diagnose or we could do a colonoscopy, which is a longer scope. We're gonna put up the other end and check out the bowel and the colon and see if there's anything to diagnose there. Those are two examples of diagnostic endoscopic procedures. After that, you can look at your history and physical exam. You should know that they're going to get a questionnaire form to fill out your patient. The first section is gonna deal with complaints or symptoms. After that, read down to um, family. So it's gonna ask uh, questions about parents and sibling and family history, just like you do at the doctor's office. They're also gonna ask treatments, and this is where we find out our patient's allergies if we get that thing before the surgery. After that, previous surgeries, pregnancies, injuries, hospitalizations. After that, go to the next paragraph. So you should be familiar with this section and what EMR stands for. And hopefully you learned that earlier in our lecture of chapter six. So electronic medical record is gonna be going with the patient wherever they go in surgery. 
another thing, you know, patient data that they're going to chart and be aware of during the case are the vital signs. So make sure you highlight, underline pulse, temperature, oxygen saturation, and blood pressure. Those are considered your patient vital signs. After that, look at all of your bullet points. So it's giving you more things that they do just diagnostically. So direct and indirect visualization. It says a pharyngeal mirror. So just like the mirror they put in your mouth in the dentist office. So a pharyngeal mirror. Advanced visualization. Pay extra attention to that one. Just by learning med terms, you should understand the, the word otoscope and ophthalmoscope. Otoscope, you should hear the oto and think ear. So you know that's a scope to look in the ear. Ophthalmoscope, you know that's a scope to look at the eye. So make sure you remember your med terms and know what those scopes are used for. After that, know your, your terms in purple and how they're going to use those diagnostically. All right, now we can finally get to diagnostic imaging. So I have some pictures of x-rays here for you because we're gonna be talking about ionized radiation. So ionizing radiation, as it says in your book, is what I labeled this slide. So let's look at that section. So I want to make sure you guys understand if we are uh, taking a picture with a C-arm, if we're taking an X-ray of any kind, really, in the operating room, we're going to typically use a C-arm for fluoroscopy, but any type of X-ray, however they take the picture, the picture that is produced is going to be called a radiograph. So it says that in your book in purple, interpretation of the radiograph. So the radiograph, G-R-A-P-H, that's the picture. Radiography is the process of getting that picture. So make sure you understand the difference between those two. This one has a little snippet of history lesson, just like chapter six had a little history about the bovi that you need to know. So it is talking about the beginning of x-rays basically. So you don't need to know the year, but 1895, Roteneg, also spelled and pronounced differently in German, but it was a German physicist who performed the experiment that produced the image and it was actually of his wife's hand that I thought was interesting. So this is where we did the first x-ray. The reason you need to know that name is because there are three different names for an x-ray. So in this small paragraph, ionizing radiation, look at your last sentence. You will find the names you to describe have included rotinography. And again, if I were German, I would probably pronounce that more correctly. Rotinography, radiography, used more commonly, and most commonly, x-ray. So know all three terms for your ionizing radiation or your x-ray. After that, plain radiography. So you need to read those first two paragraphs and pay attention to those, but I'm not going to read it to you. It's more information about what you're looking at on my pretty slideshow here. You've got all different types of x-rays. Things you need to pay attention to. So look at this picture of a posterior and anterior chest x-ray. If these were not labeled PA and AP, I would still be able to know which one was from the front and which one was taken from the back. So you can tell that by looking at the heart. Your heart is always gonna to lean to the left, right? Or excuse me, lie more on the left side. So because of that, if your patient is turned around and you're taking the picture from the back, it's gonna look like it's leaning the laying in the opposite direction. So little things like that you should look for and pay attention to when looking at an x-ray because we're not gonna be x-ray technicians, we're not gonna be taking the picture, we're also not radiologists, we're not gonna be reading the picture, but you are going to be looking at that picture while the surgeon is working and you want to understand what you're looking at and be able to follow the case. Okay, so plain radiography, like I said, read those first two paragraphs. Look at the next paragraph. So preoperative, so again, diagnostic, preoperative, we're going to get some chest x-rays and they're typically ordered by the anesthesia provider. You need to know that. Looking at your next section, it's talking about thoracic surgery. So with thoracic surgery, examinations of the lungs can reveal lung disease, a collapsed lung, a fusion, or even a tumor. So of course, thoracic surgeons are gonna know a deal more about that anatomy, but 
chest x-rays beforehand can help diagnose with these. Look for the word in purple, cystoscopy. So in the OR, plain radiographic films may be a fixed x-ray or included in a cystoscopy. For these rooms, retrograde urography or cystoscopy is going to be used. So why don't you make a note next to cystoscopy. Again, if you know your med terms, you should already know what this word means without me telling you. And hopefully you're getting to that point as you read through this book, you're not thinking, what does that mean? You know, because you should know from your med terminology. So cystoscopy, oscopy, we're taking a scope and we're looking in the cysto means bladder. So that means we have a scope inside the bladder. Sometimes, especially kidney stones, we might put a wire up that ureter to try to get something to pull that stone out. Sometimes there's a basket, so we call it or a grasper, that you can grab that stone and get it out of that ureter. But they're going to use x-ray during cystoscopy cases to verify where they're at. They can use contrast media, which you learned about in pharmacology, to make that light up on x-ray. So they can make those ureters light up so when they're looking at the x-ray, they can tell if they are in the correct spot or not. Or maybe if they're looking for a stone, they can see exactly where it is so they can hunt and find it better. So cystoscopy, make sure you know what type of surgery that is, where they're going to be doing it. Where it says retrograde urography, you should know what that means. So I will not break that one down for you because that is basic med terms. So if you don't remember, make sure you remind yourself what retrograde versus antegrade means. Okay, now look at your bullet point. So identify location of abnormalities and also foreign bullets. So this is telling you that in addition to abnormalities, it can light up things like bullets and make it easier to find them. Okay, look at page 383 directly under your figure 13-2. So this one is another x-ray like is on my screen, but it is a femur fracture. So it's telling you how to deal with this intraoperatively because the C-arm is not a sterile thing. It's a huge piece of equipment. You're bringing it up to your sterile field that's covered in drapes. Because of that, you are going to have to cover that C-arm in a drape. Oops, I went too far. And uh, because you're going to cover it in that drape, I'm going to give you lots of options, but here's the part I want you to pay attention to. So directly under that picture, as I said, if the x-ray tube is to be positioned over the operative field, the tube itself may be covered with a sterile drape. Then look at the very bottom of that section. So it talks about the radiologist reading the x-ray. So the surgeon will read, it has in quotes, the film intraoperatively. However, the radiologist must be requested for an official reading. So again, a surgeon is not a radiologist. They should get confirmation from a radiologist on their x-rays. Okay, mammography. You actually have a picture of this one on your slide right here. So they are of a needle right here. And you can also see what just the mammography looks like over here. So find where it says needle aspiration biopsy. So I am directly under the next picture, mammography of a sarcoma. So that's figure 13-3 on page 383. So mammography can be performed in radiology in conjunction with a needle aspiration biopsy. So example, this needle that is stuck in the breast tissue right here. So with a biopsy, you can do a very long fine needle that can be used for biopsy and I'll show you some of these biopsy options in the classroom. Also pay attention to the area where it says preoperative needle localization. So PNL exactly as you're seeing on this picture. So needle localization, this is very common to make sure you're getting out the entire tumor and you're not messing with any tum uh, tissue around it they will stick a needle in it preoperatively. So that means when your patient comes to you in the OR, they have a big needle sticking out of their breast tissue. When they get asleep and prepped and positioned and everything, it is a little more difficult to work around that needle. So you have to be extra precautious 
and look out for that sharp sticking out. But you'll see after they make the incision and they get down to the tumor, that needle is placed perfectly inside the tumor. So it makes it easier to excise that tumor and make sure you got it all and you didn't damage any extra tissue around it. So P and L, make sure you know that term, preoperative needle localization. Again, down the bottom, it reminds you, this is typically with breast lesions that are difficult to palpate. So you can't feel them as well, but they can see it on imaging. Because you can't feel it as well, we are going to go into the operating room with a needle inside it. So we're not digging around and searching in surgery. We're going exactly to where the problem is. Okay, that brings me to the next one. Radiopaque contrast media imaging. There's my contrast media. So these are just some examples. There are so many options for contrast media. But again, the idea is we're going to eject this into anything with a lumen. So it gives you options here. So after contrast media on that page, inject it into arteries, veins, duct, subarachnoid space, any anatomical structure that we want to stand out in contrast to everything else. So again, I gotta go back, look at these x-rays it's gonna make something else stand out in contrast to all this black and white. So this contrast media is what's going to help us get there. So look at your list of all the different medications. Look at the ones I provided for you on the screen. These are the most commonly used ones. These are the ones I want you to focus on. So I'd like you to highlight in your book, Hypake. See where it says Omnipake on my slideshow, that's my closest to Hypake. Renographin, very similar to gastrographin, exactly as I have pictured. Cystographin, Conray, as on my screen, and Isoview. So many different contrast medias, some are specific for spe specific specialties, but this is what will be on your preference card. So do you have to remember, I'm gonna use Isoview 300 with this surgeon, and I'm gonna use Omnipake with this surgeon? It'd be good for you to remember those things, but it's all going to be on your preference card. So if you're new or a student, it'll tell you on that preference card what to, medication you're going to use for the case. So it'll tell you which contrast media to use. Go down to your second paragraph after that. It starts with most contrast media. So most contrast media are hypertonic, viscid. That means it's a uh, thick and doesn't flow out like water does. It's a little more thick than that, viscid, and high sodium. Now there's one more important that you need to pay attention to. You need to know all of those things, but most importantly, has a high iodine content. It's a high iodine content. So if you're wondering why is that important? Why would I need to know there's iodine? Hopefully you are critical thinking right now and someone thought of allergies. What if someone is allergic to iodine? you cannot give that contrast media to that patient. So you need to know which one of these contrast medias have iodine and which ones do not. So for you, you need to know, find where it says in your book, additionally, a patient may be allergic to contrast media. So you have to be aware of their allergies and make sure everyone in the room is aware of those allergies too. Okay, so here's my great picture. Purpose of your contrast media. So you can see in this picture, looking at one picture, you can't see the bowel. Looking at the second picture, you can see the bowel. So this patient has contrast media inside their bowel and it is lighting up, making that contrast so that we can see during surgery. So instead of acting blindly, we are following the picture. So as it says to enhance subject contrast um, in a tissue that normally has low subject contrast. That's your purpose of contrast media. Well, that rolls me right into CT scans. I'm not gonna go too into detail with these because again, this is all before the surgery, before the surgery. So know what a CT scan is. No, it's also called a CAT scan. Look and find where it says the uses. It says the CT scan uses. So it uses ionizing electromagnetic radiation. So the part you need to pay attention to is that M for magnet. So electromagnetic radiation. It's going to create an image and there's lots of examples in your book for you. So figure 13-4 has got some examples of those for you. I want you to look on the other side, but same page. So I'm on 
384 on the right side, top of the page. So CT image can sometimes be enhanced with the use of iodine-based contrast media. We just learned about that. This is given to the patient intravenously. That's the part I want you to hear. So far, we've been talking about using contrast media diagnostic before, or maybe in surgery. You know, we would be using it to put up a ureter in surgery. This is talking about, um, excuse me, this is talking about giving it intravenously for the patient during their scan. So it's going to be given to the patient intravenously, uh, contrast medium, and it's usually going to be iodine based. The contrast medium may be used on individuals who are otherwise allergic to iodine. In most cases, the patient is giving a steroid in preparation prior to the injection. So that means there's some times where we can't substitute something else. So they know the patient is, might have an allergic reaction to this contrast media because it has iodine in it. They're allergic to iodine, but they can't use something different. There's nothing else that is going to make that contrast work. So it's telling you what they do when they don't have another option, and that is give the patient steroids. So I broke that one down for you. So if we don't have another option, we give the patient steroids prior to the injection. Okay. So your CT scan. After that, look at fluoroscopy. Uh, so fluoroscopy makes me go, ah, because this is what I know. This is what we use in the operating room. This is what we as scrub techs know very well. And you can see the clear plastic drape that is over it right here. So this is your C-arm drape. If you look right here, you will see there's an even better version. It's called a C-armor drape. So not only do they have the C-drape on, C-arm drape on, they have the C-armor that Velcros to the side of the field. So as you know, anything below the sterile field is contaminated. So they put it right at the edge with little pieces of Velcro. And all you have to do is hold that little bag out. And then that bottom of the C-arm can loop under the patient's bed and come on the side. So the idea is here's the patient's bed. Typically we're taking pictures like this with the C-arm. With that C-armor, we're able to swoop it under and get a picture like this. So if they want an A and P picture, you got it. You want a lateral picture? You got it. You can do that with the C armor drape. So let's look in your book. Fluoroscopy. So know what fluoroscopy means. Amplification is achieved by using an image intensifier. An image intensifier. So make sure you're reading over all of this part. Let's go to page 385. The image intensifier in the tube are in direct opposition. So the C-arm is frequently used in conjunction with the OR table. So it's telling you the C-arms going over the OR table, just as I explained to you with the patient. The term I want you to pay attention to is radiolucence. Radiolucence. So the OR table or bed is going to allow the x-ray to pass through the tabletop. And again, that's referred to as radiolucent. So not all OR beds do that. So it's part of your job actually to prepare the room. In general, you're the circulators getting the stuff ready for the room. The scrub tech is opening the instruments and getting those type of things ready. But as you know, you're going to be doing both roles. You could be in a room doing the circulator role, even though of course you're not charting or doing anything out of your scope of practice. But you will be doing circulator roles, so you need to know how to do these things. So making sure you have the right bed. So it is radiolucent and you'll be able to get that C-arm underneath the bed. Sometimes the bed isn't set up to where a C-arm can come underneath it either. Sometimes you have to rearrange, put the head at the foot or the foot at the head to make it long enough, make it enough room for the patient to have an x-ray. So all things you can play with in the lab, playing with the bed, getting it ready for x-ray. After that, all of those bullet points, be familiar with all of them especially cholangiography, which I will get to. Okay, after fluoroscopy, I put a mini C-arm, who I'm glad I didn't keep going. I put a mini C-arm on here for you. That's because your book didn't really focus on it a lot. The mini C-arm is used for smaller cases, of course, for many things. So your hand is a great example. So if you have an orthopedic case on a knee, on a hip, big C-arm. If you are pinning a hand, a little fracture, mini C-arm. 
What's really nice about this one is yes, it can be covered in a sterile drape just like this one, but the petal, instead of having the big C arm come in and have to have an x-ray tech take the pictures, you can get that petal and take your own pictures. Of course, you're gonna receive much better pictures, more precise with an x-ray technician, but it's very common as a scrub tech for you to have that foot pedal and take pictures during the case. Normally there's two pedals and you can make a note on the side with this. There are two pedals and you will need to know the difference between the two. I'll give you the terms that they're actually gonna use in surgery. So if they want a video, a live feed, they're gonna say go live and you will put your foot on the go live button. Other times they're just going to take a single image, quick picture, less x-ray radi or sorry, radiation exposure, x-ray exposure for the room if we just take little pictures. So they might say picture, 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 go live. And they might, you know, do something, try to approx uh, try to line up that fracture as they're going live. But every time you hit that button that's go live, you're getting that constant fluoro everybody's getting radiated. So even though you have that lead on, that is not something you wanna to do to keep your foot on that go live button. We wanna either take a picture or do a quick image and let your foot off that pedal as soon as possible. So just something to add to keep in mind with fluoroscopy, because that's what you're gonna be using in the operating room. Big CR and the little CR. Oh, that brings me to most important part, lead aprons. Anytime you're in the operating room, you need to protect yourself. So this is necessary as a script tech, make sure you have your lead on. But as a student, you don't have a choice. You are rep representing our school. So you need to be covered in safety gear always. So if you ever hear somebody say, eh, I'm not gonna wear lead, I'm not worried about it. Good for them, you don't get that choice. You're a student, you're representing us. You're going to wear lead and look like you were prepared for your case and protecting yourself. So I put an old school picture on here so you can see how far we've come in the world. This is where we were with lead <laughs> gowns and gloves. And this is pretty much what you see at most facilities now, unless they are up to date and they are here. So you will see it in pieces now, but the idea is you should at least have your front completely covered. These wraparounds are better. So if you have to turn to the side or something, you're still covered by lead. What I want to make very important to you is this thyroid shield. My instructor actually was diagnosed with thyroid cancer because she did orthopedic surgery as a scrub tech for years and she was never provided a thyroid shield. So all hospitals now are required to have protection for you. So all you have to say is, where is the thyroid shield? I need one and they will get you one. So again, you should have full lead on and a thyroid shield because you can see right here, these older lead aprons, they don't go high enough to cover your thyroid. And why would you protect everything but your thyroid gland? That doesn't make any sense. So let's protect everything, keep you safe and healthy. Wear your thyroid shield. Okay, last good picture of seeing the difference, right? So hopefully you already know these terms. This should be review for you. So we have metal that is very opaque. So this is a metal implant, looks like a hip implant. Bone, radiopaque, it shows up on the picture. Gas, I'm seeing through it, is radiolucent. I'm seeing right through it. So again, we'll do an example with our sterile items. A Raytech or a lap sponge, that blue squiggly line, that's radiopaque, radiopaque. It lights up an x-ray. So if we accidentally leave a sponge in a patient, it lights up like contrast on that x-ray. We never want anything to be radiolucent and it get past us and we not see it. Okay. Myeliography. So I put a picture on here for you in case what's in the book is not detailed enough for you. So myeliography is also useful for patients who are unable to go an MRI because of metallic implants, but they are usually going to do a myeliography to look at that spinal cord. So MRI is useful in imaging of the spinal cord, nerve, roots, and discs, but myeliography is better for those patients who can't undergo the MRI. So this image should explain everything about myeliography for you, so you can see exactly which space they are entering into here. So look at your last paragraph. 
So myeliographic studies, contrast medium is injected into the subarachnoid space in the lumbar area. This contrast medium outlines the spinal cord and the nerve roots on the x-ray film. So make sure you know that section and you can use this picture to better help you understand it. Okay, angiography. Angiography is beautiful. I love angiography because it makes it just light up so beautifully and you get to be in the hybrid OR. So angiography, uh, this is the reference standard for assessing cause for peripheral vascular disease. So anything vascular, there's an issue, we're going to find it with angiography. It is a preliminary diagnostic technique. Now it has other functions too, but I want you to know it as a diagnostic technique. Also find in this first paragraph where it says hybrid OR. You need to know that this is done in a hybrid OR. So this doesn't look like a normal operating room. It has a C-arm attached to the wall, many monitors, and look at this viewing room. So this viewing room, the glass is protected. So it's it, like wearing a lead apron basically. So you are protected by a lead wall so you can take your lead apron off and sit down and relax and watch what's going on in the hybrid OR. They also have lots of controls for the C-arm and imaging and lots of high-tech things in that hybrid OR. So after that paragraph, look at the next one. It says essential equipment for angiography. So essential equipment for angiography includes the x-ray unit that's capable of both fluoroscopy and recording still pictures. There's also pressure injectors for administration of contrast media, like we talked about, through catheters, guide wires, and needle cannulas assemblies. So it's telling you different things that they're going to do in this hybrid OR. So read through this, but again, we're going to be looking at arteries and vessels. So anything with peripheral vascular disease, any type of aneurysms, things like that. Vascular issues, we're going to look at them in angiography. That's going to give us the best picture and the best diagnosis. Go to the other side of page 385. So I'm on the right side of the page, one, two, three, fourth paragraph down. It starts with flexible atraumatic guide wires. So flexible atraumatic guide wires are going to be used during these types of procedures. So they're going to have a guide, see where it says guide? They're going to have a catheter to tip and guide the catheter to the proper location. If you keep reading down, find where it says the guide wire is called a J wire because of that flexible tip. That's the part I really want you to know. So the idea is angiography, we're not making any incisions like a big one, like in surgery, we're just making a poke hole percutaneous. So we will poke a hole in that vessel, feed a guide wire up it, and then look at images. We're going to take a bunch of x-rays and look at it on the imaging. And then from there, we can make decisions. We can diagnose, we can treat, we can do different things. So say a vessel is collapsed, you just threaded a guide wire through it. From there, they could thread a stent down, and then that stent could keep it open and patent, like a little cage to keep that vessel patent and open and blood flowing through it naturally. So example is putting in a stent for angiography. So if you're wondering what are they using these guide wires for, it's because there's no incisions. We're trying to stick something up a vessel, typically starting at their uh, groin, and we thread it all the way up to maybe the heart or maybe the brain. Very dangerous areas, but we're threading it up through a guide wire. Very cool. After that, cardiac catheterization. So this one's going to permit the evaluation of heart function, visualization of coronary arteries, and the chambers of the heart. So cardiac catheterization is also going to be done in a hybrid OR. So that's why you see this viewing area. And then also they are right next to the patient passing a guide wire into the heart. So exact same idea. So if you hear cardiac cath lab, that is a hybrid OR. If you hear angiography suite, that is a hybrid OR. They're kind of the same thing. All right, so cardiac catheterization. Go all the way down, find where it says ejection fracture in bright purple for you. I'm looking at that paragraph. You need to read all of that. 
Left heart studies include left ventriculogram, coronary arteriogram, and the measurement of the left pressures. The term ejection fracture, here's where I want you to pay attention, refers to the percentage of blood that's pumped out of a filled in ventricle within each heart beat. So that is called your ejection fraction. That's what they're going to be looking at and measuring. After that, flip it over to page 386. So I want you to read the top of that and understand ejection fraction and how that's going to and why that's going to be looked at in angiography. But I want you to look at the next paragraph. These terms are very important. So it's going to tell you the technique. Like I said, they're going to put these guide wires in at the groin. That was your layman's terms. I'm going to read what's in the book and help explain that. So next paragraph, page 386. Using the Scheldinger technique, a catheter is introduced into the femoral artery. So that's why I said at the groin, we're finding the femoral artery and inserting a guide wire or a catheter. So in this case, it's a catheter introduced into the femoral artery and positioned over the left coronary system. And again, under fluoroscopy. So we are putting in a guide wire at the groin trailing it all the way up to the heart, specifically left coronary system. So find a little further down where it says left coronary system is clearly outlined. So that is the goal of that technique. So the Scheldinger technique, we're starting at the groin, the femoral artery, and going all the way up to the left side of the heart. So we are doing the left coronary system and making sure it's clearly outlined. That's your technique. That's one that I want you to pay attention to. Look at the next paragraph. See where it says pigtail catheter? Those are typically the catheters they use in angiography or the cath lab. So I want you to be familiar with that term, pigtail catheter, and where they can position it. So pigtail catheter that is positioned through the aortic valve into the left ventricle. Left ventricle is the part I want you to hear. Your Scheldinger technique, it goes over it in more detail in your box in purple at the bottom. So if you didn't understand the way I said it, look at this purple box and read all the way through it. Again, it's telling you they're starting at the groin, they're threading a guide wire up to the heart before taking their pictures. And of course, using contrast media to make it all light up so they can see what they're looking at. Okay, that's your cardiac catheterization, cholangiography. I really helped you guys out with this one. I'm giving you a hint for next week's chapter. Next week, you're gonna need to know during a cholecystectomy, so that's removing the gallbladder laparoscopically, what they're clipping and what they're cutting. That's what you need to know. So again, cholangiography, this is laparoscopic. So they are going to, here I'll read to you what's in the book actually. Cholangiography performed intra-op, so during the uh, removal of the gallbladder, <clears throat> uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy or common bile duct exploration. So it's telling you that this is a, they can do it as a way to explore the common bile duct and also get verification that they are in the correct spot. So they want, uh, they want verification that they're in the right spot before they make final cuts. So a sterile cholangiogram, it's just a catheter, it's just a tube is inserted through a tiny incision in the cystic duct, which connects the gallbladder to that common duct. The contrast media is gonna be injected. That's something you're gonna pull up and pass over to the surgeon. Uh, that contrast media is going to light up the biliary system. So you'll see the outline of calculi, kidney stones, and any other obstructions on fluoroscopy. So it's gonna help things light up. It could also confirm their placement of where they're clipping before they cut. Okay, so read over cholangiography, understand that they're gonna be doing that during a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. As it says in your book, they can also do it on an open cholecystectomy. But as you heard today, that's not as common. We go laparoscopic before we try to open up a patient. Okay, so next I go to, I skip over a little bit and go to radioisotope imaging. That is because on urography, I already talked about that when I talked about uh, cystoscopy. So in the very beginning when I talked about cystoscopy, I asked you what retrograde meant. 
and all of those terms. And I said, that's all review. So if you want more review, it is right here under hierography. So make sure you reading that portion and understanding it. So now I can go to radioisotope imaging or PET scans. So PET scans I'll talk about before synchtography, but radioisotope imaging uses radioactive medications to assist in locating tumors. That's what we're gonna focus on, locating tumors. There's two types, I got two up here for you, PET scan and synchtography. Next to radioisotope imaging in bright green, I need you to put an AKA for this one because there's two names for this in hospitals. So I want you to put AKA nuclear medicine. So if you've ever been in a hospital and you see a section that says nuclear medicine and you're like, I wonder what they do over there. This is an idea of some of what they do over there. Radioisotope imaging. So PET scan and synchtography is done. So now we can look specifically at PET scan. Look at the top of the right side of the page. So positron emission tomography. You should know what it means, of course, PET scanning, and know what it's doing. Combining your CT with your radioisotope scanning. So it's combining those two things to make it a PET scan. So PET scans like to utilize radio tracers. So you'll read about that so you can understand the purpose of radio tracers. After that, look at synchtography. Synchtography. So also known as isotope scanning, you need to know that. Isotope scanning used in nuclear medicine, like I said. Look at your last sentence, got a lot of words in italics. Collections of isotopes in certain areas are referred to as hotspots and may indicate the presence of a pathological condition. So if they see hotspots, that's their cue. There might be some pathology. There might be something bad happening there. We need to go look at that. That's what the hotspots are telling you on a PET scan. I want you to put an example next to synchtography also. And I want you to put bone scan. So if you've ever talked to a cancer patient, uh, very commonly they're gonna do what's called a bone scan. So they're doing a bone scan to look for cancer in the bone specifically. So that's an example of synchtography. As you read down, you can see lots of others. So brain synchtography, um, breast, cardiac. I want you to more focus on what synchtography is and that it's also known as isotope scanning. Okay, on page 388 at the top, let's talk about MRIs. So MRI, I have cool pictures of that for you because I like neurosurgery. So you're gonna see some cool brain MRIs. So know what it stands for? Magnetic resonance imaging. Go down to the third paragraph, know that they can use contrast media with this one. And if you look at the top of the right side of the page, the contrast medium used for MRI is not iodine based. Isn't that nice? You don't have to worry about the iodine allergies with this one. I put some extra images so that you can see, first of all, right here, I wanted you to really see the picture difference with MRI versus PET scan, MRA, you know, that's and geography like we just talked about, and then an x-ray of the brain. So it looks totally different. And then I want you to see how they're gonna use that images intraoperatively. So neuro is just my example. There's many more where we use this MRI and then are able to get a live feed of the picture during the surgery up on the screen. So the surgeon has a probe basically, and every time they put that probe in, it communicates with that MRI machine and it gives a live picture of the right trajectory. So if a surgeon is trying to get a brain tumor deep inside the head, they might be holding the probe like this and the machine is telling them if they angle it this way, they're gonna do a lot less tissue damage and take out a lot less brain tissue. So that's why these machines are so amazing. So if you ever hear intra-op navigation, which you should hear a little bit about that in the last chapter, that should help you understand kind of what's happening on navigation cases. They're gonna use that MRI images to make a live feed to make decisions during the case. Okay, ultrasonography. So as far as in your book, I'll hit that first. Ultrasonography, know the high frequency sound waves. Yes, you need to know the numbers. So one to 10 million Hertz. Ultrasound's a diagnostic tool. You need to know that, very useful diagnostic tool for examination of the heart and abdominal and pelvic cavities. Very useful for that. You need to know what it's ineffective for. 
So ultrasound is completely ineffective for the lungs. So it's not used to examine the lungs. And then of course we know ultrasound is very good for looking at our fetus in the abdominal cavity. Let's look at Doppler ultrasonography. So that's what I have on your slide here. So the Doppler monitor measures blood flow that transmits the sound of red blood cells to the transducer. Let me break it down, the Doppler for you. So looking at this Doppler probe right here, and again, this is gonna be sterile. So the probe will be sterile. It'll be plugged into the box non-sterile. Kind of the same idea as the Bovi. The whole thing's sterile, but you're gonna pass off the end that needs to be plugged in. So that, that part's gonna now be contaminated, but you can still use the sterile end of it. So intra-op, you come across a vessel like this right here. They wanna make sure there's no issues with it, that the blood is flowing through it properly. So they're gonna put the Doppler over the vessel and you're gonna actually hear the blood flowing through it. That's what the Doppler box does. So the box has a speaker on it for a reason. You're gonna put that Doppler probe over it and if the blood is flowing normally, you'll hear whoosh, 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 whoosh. <laughs> it's very cool to hear that the first time. You can actually hear the force of blood pulsing through the body. Very cool. At the same time, if they're going and checking a vessel they just did an anastomosis on, you're waiting to hear that sound. And if you don't hear that rushing blood sound, that's a bad sign. That means something got messed up somewhere. The blood is not flowing how it should be. So know what your Doppler ultrasound is used for. And I put lots of different pictures on here so you could see it's not just one type of Doppler. There's so many different kinds. So again, ask questions. Is this a disposable or non-disposable item every time? So on Doppler ultrasonography, let's look at that last sentence on page 388. You need to know that. Doppler ultrasonography is used in the OR to determine patency, so openness of a vessel or arterial anastomosis. The Doppler probe is covered with sterile drape for use with the sterile field. Some of them are covered with a sterile drape. That's the note I need to make on the side. Some of them are covered with a sterile drape. Others just come sterile, especially the disposable ones, like these plastic ones we use in neuro. They're plastic, they're one use, and they get thrown away. So some need a sterile drape and some do not. They'll just come sterile. Make sure you add that note on there. So next, I actually skip to the TEE. So look at electrocardiography, it's in there. Electrocardiography, so ultrasound study of the heart. You should already know that. So let's go to the next paragraph, look at TEE. This is a TEE probe. Anesthesia providers use this very often for diagnosing before the case. You need to know exactly what it is. So transesophageal echocardiography, that's what TEE stands for. So they consider it slightly more invasive, but um, they introduce a transducer attached to a gastroscope, so it's going to go all the way down to the stomach, into the esophagus, bringing the probe in close approximation to the heart. So they actually go down the esophagus, but the TE probe tip is right next to the heart. So because of that, they can ultrasound the heart through the esophagus. I thought that was very cool when I saw that for the first time. So transesophageal echocardiogram. Okay, after that, there's a lot of detail stuff just in the book that you need to look at. So, plasmography, you really, I want you to go all the way down to the bottom of the page, 389, bottom of the page. I want you to really think about the deep vein thrombosis portion of this. So, diagnosing deep vein thrombosis can be made with plethrography. Um, where is it? in which rhythmic changes in venous volume in the legs associated with respiration, respiration are recorded. So again, this is to diagnose um, with vascular issues. So specifically with deep vein thrombosis, they can use that one. After that, you should know what electrocardiography is. So know what an electrocardiogram is in contrast. The ECG, know that it can also be referred to as EKG. So know both acronyms for that one. After that, look at your second paragraph. It's all in italics. Electrocardiography is performed by placing 
electrodes on the skin, arms, legs, torso to record electrical activity of the heart. So hopefully now you've got both and you know the difference between the two. The next section, you should know Holter Monitor. So Holter Monitor is like a portable 24 hour monitoring device for people with dysrhythmias. Now they also give this to people, you know, who might uh, be thinking about heart surgery or just had heart surgery, but it's gonna give them that 24 hour monitoring so they can really look at some data after you've had it on. Because if you don't have it on all day, you're not getting the proper data out of it. So know what a Holter monitor is for your exam. You know that they're gonna be using that for about 24 hours of monitoring. Uh, last paragraph, ECG is useful for graded exercise testing. So stress tests uh, where they make you run on a treadmill while giving you different tests. That's what it's good for. Also look at your last sentence in this section. So this is right above your EEG picture. So it's telling you it also indicates the presence of a myocardial ischemia for patients with angina. So you should already know those terms. I'm just telling you what to pay attention to as you study. After that, Ah, I get this question a lot. Do I need to be able to read this EEG? No, you're not gonna have to be able to read it. So what I want you to pay attention to are the names of the waves. You do need to know that. So you see all the different waves in your book in that picture on page 389? That is really all I want you to pay attention to. So you can circle on the left side where it says P, that's your P wave. You can circle T, that's your T wave, where that ventricle repolarization happens. And then U, the U wave, at the end. Those are really, that's what I want you to pay attention to, the names of the waves. Because are you going to be reading EEGs? No, you're not. No, you're not. You just want to be familiar so you can have a conversation with these people about these things. Okay, flip it over, page 390. There we go, EEG. So this is the part, more importantly, I want you to pay attention to. Used to help diagnose seizure disorders, brain tumors, and other diseases like injuries to the brain. That's what EEG is going to be used for. After that, look at your next paragraph. It's talking about seizures a little bit more. When used in the diagnosis of seizures, EEG measurements are taken during a seizure and during a period of normal brain activity. This helps to localize the origin of the seizure. Fun fact, you'll hear this in neurosurgery, but actually during neuro procedures, when the patient's skull flap is off of their head and there's just brain tissue there, if our patient goes into a seizure, we can actually put ice cold saline on their brain and it will stop their seizure. So really cool things you get to see in surgery. Uh, after that, you can read the next two, electromyography and intraoperative neuromonitoring. But intraoperative neuromonitoring is when we're going to put little needles in the patient to track all different nerves throughout the case because we're working on nerves, especially spinal cases. They could be working on the spine and then pull out a nerve root and they could paralyze the patient. So now we do neuromonitoring to prevent things like that. So they're monitoring all the nerves, and then when something changes, they can notify the surgeon, hey, we have a nerve firing um, at L5, lumbar five. And then they can look at that, see if they've done any damage and repair it if possible. Mm -hmm. After that, you can look at pulmonary assessment, and it starts with pulse oximetry pulse oximetry. So you do need to know those percentages of oxygen administration. And then I want you to look at capnography. So capnography was designed uh, to estimate arterial levels of carbon dioxide during surgery. That's the part I want you to pay attention to. If you pay attention to all the other words, you may not catch the important part. So one more time, capnography was designed to estimate arterial levels of carbon dioxide in surgical patients. 
So again, this is required mechanical ventilation based off of the amount of carbon dioxide that is exhaled. So you'll hear this term all the time, entitled CO2. So it's just the amount of carbon dioxide they have exhaled during that case. So again, entitled CO2, I want you to know that term, and capnography. And this is also telling you that they don't just follow your oxygen levels and your urinary output during surgery. They monitor everything, even your carbon dioxide output. So they're monitoring and charting every little piece. Right under your blood gas values, look under that section. Capnography is helpful in detecting dislodged or malfunctioning endotracheal tubes also. After that, spirotomy. So this is a non-invasive technique for evaluating the patient's respiratory status. After that, now we can look at blood gases. So next to blood gases, I want you to write a little note, just put pulmonary. It's talking about pulmonary blood gases. So this is venous or arterial blood drawn from the patient for visual examination in the laboratory setting. So again, pulmonary blood gases. So now that we finally hit blood gases, look up at the table 13-1. Now I want you to be familiar with these, but you're not gonna be an anesthesia provider. You're gonna be a surgical technologist. So I'd rather you pay attention to the important percentages. So I want you to know arterial saturation is 96 to 100% of capacity. So arterial saturation is 100 or sorry, 96 to 100% of capacity. That's the blood gas value. You can look at venous saturation and see the difference between the two, but again, that's the one I want you to memorize. Okay. After that, we will have to look over at page 391. So on 391, I want you to read over the hematology values, but there's nothing on there that we want you to memorize for today. Nothing we want you to memorize. Okay, so I will finish up all of these laboratory studies, your culture and sensitivity, all of that stuff um, with a second lecture to break it up and make it a little bit shorter for you. So I hope this helped you understand, especially uh, imaging types of diagnostic procedures or just images that they take before surgery so that they can make the right decisions during the case. It was more old school to take a bunch of pictures before surgery and then when we're in there, we're kind of working blindly and glancing back at the picture. Nowadays, we can take live fluoroscopy, we can do angiography, we can do live images right in front of us right before we make those final cuts. So because of that, we are better at surgery and we're making less mistakes because of it. So anything that is diagnostic that morphs into removing something, that is fantastic because that means we did it the right way. We diagnosed it first with maybe a diagnostic laparoscopy and then we decided to remove it after we found out what it was. So diagnostic imaging is very important for surgery. So I hope you learned something and you enjoyed it. I will be back with another lecture uh, to finish up this chapter soon. Thank you. Bye.